food becomes the biggest issue for people as we go through these transitions. And according to the BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics, food inflation on a, a, a nice select basket, a pretty broad basket, uh, between 1913 and 2024 has gone up something like 2,500 and change percent. Silver during that same time frame and through Friday was up about 2,900 and change percent. So silver maintained, I mean, I mean, you got to look at a loaf of bread at $1.98 or something like that and wonder where they're really buying it. But okay, let's assume that that data is accurate. Silver clearly maintained your ability to purchase and you could actually buy roughly 20% more with that same, if you had, if you had it in silver, yep. than you could if you had it in dollars. So it yep. maintained. Zhang begins by discussing the importance of the inverted yield curve a critical economic indicator that has historically predicted recessions. She points out that the two-year and 30-year Treasury yields have inverted, and now the 10-year yield is flirting with inversion as well. Traditionally, the inversion of short-term and long-term rate signals that a recession is on the horizon. According to Zhang, while analysts claim this time is different, she asserts that the underlying risks remain the same. The significance of an inverted yield curve lies in the reality that a recession is coming and the only tools central banks have to combat it are inflation, money printing, and dropping interest rates. Zhang highlights that while people may hope for rate cuts, it's critical to be cautious. The easing of monetary policy could further weaken the economy and devalue the currency, creating longer-term problems that will be difficult to undo. Zhang transitions into discussing Wall Street's role in fueling speculative bubbles, especially in sectors like AI and technology. She explains that financial elites frequently create and inflate asset bubbles, driving up prices before dumping them on the public. As we saw recently with the Nvidia sell-off and the broader chip sector correction, these bubbles are precarious, leaving ordinary investors to suffer when the collapse inevitably comes. She poses an important question. When will the public heed the warnings and take action? The financial elite are already preparing for the next crisis, yet most people remain unaware. Zhang underscores the importance of having a strategy in place now before the house of cards collapses so that individuals can avoid significant financial loss. According to Zhang, the foundation of the financial system has been broken for decades. She describes how interest rates have been driven lower and lower over the past 40 years, culminating in near zero interest rates after the 2008 financial crisis. This pattern, she notes, is a fundamental shift in the world's largest market which is driven by debt and endless money printing. As Zhang observes, the problem hasn't been fixed, and the system has only grown more bloated and fragile. Japan has led the way in manipulating debt markets with tools like quantitative easing key and yield curve control, but none of these measures have solved the underlying issue. They've only delayed the inevitable collapse. In fact, Zhang warns that the crisis ahead will be far worse than what we saw in 2008 because the system has become even more over-leveraged. Now we'll show you the best clips of the latest interview. But first hit the like button, smash the subscribe button and turn on notifications so you do not miss out our daily recaps. There's a lot that's going on and even going back to that, I, I pay attention to the inverted yield curve quite a bit because they always want you to think that this time is different, but it's not. And what's so significant uh, because the two and the 30 year had reverted and now it's flirting with the 10. So the two and the 10, a little bit here and a little bit there. But it's when that reversion actually happens that we typically do see that uh, that quote unquote recession. But here's the problem. There's only one way to fight a recession. And that's with inflation and money printing and dropping interest rates. So when they're talking about dropping the interest rates, you know, you should always be careful of what you wish for. So, you know, the labor numbers are showing that it's slower than what they wanted us to think. And the numbers that even came out today were worse. So, you know, I think let's go back a month. Right. When you had to your point, the um, the unpartial 
unwind of the yen carry trade. And then they stepped right back in there really fast and said, oh, no, 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 nothing to see here, folks. Everything is just dandy. But what happened yesterday with the huge sell-off in NVIDIA and in the chip sector and the IA sector, I mean, Wall Street is always looking for some balloon and some bubble to blow up. And then when the public participates, by that point, they're out and the public eats it in the shorts. Let, let, let's face it. So I think that what was happening, we, we keep getting these warnings. We keep getting these warnings that that, that gets then covered up. But my question is, um, because I'm right with you there, Zach, I'm wanting to be prepared on many, many levels, which is why the strategy that I execute is built in layers, right? But at what point will the public heed the warning to get into position so that when this whole house of cards comes tumbling down, that they're not so negatively impacted by it? Here's the thing. Use, if you look at the interest rate chart on the interest rates that the Fed controls directly, what you see is a 40-year pattern of lower and lower and lower and lower highs until they got to zero and held it there for 15 years, and then they ratcheted up. That is a fundamental shift in the largest market in the world. That breaks a 40-year trend cycle. That matters. It matters hugely since the whole system is built on never-ending debt and never-ending money printing. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think the main event, we haven't even marginally seen the main event. We've just seen little warnings. And did they fix the problem? No, when you're looking at Japan, since the 90s, they're the ones that have led the way in all of this innovative and creative manipulation of the debt market with QE, QT, QWI. And I mean, it's a, it's a tremendous alphabet soup. And here we are in 2024, and all of those manipulations didn't fix any problem it just makes it bigger and bigger and bigger as they pretend and extend which means that the crisis that's yet ahead of us is so much bigger than anything that we would have had to have done bigger than 2008 because that's really when the system died and all they did was make the system even more bloated and fragile that's where we are bloated and fragile First of all, you have to understand what the real job is, which is to keep everybody in the system because then it makes the theft a whole lot easier and it supports, you know, like George Carlin, and some of you might not know who he was, but he was a brilliant comedian who said, this is just a big club and you and I ain't in it. Right. So, you know, it re this really is about a wealth transfer mechanism. It's been that way since 1913, so this is not new. The difference is, is that was the beginning, and this is absolutely the end. So the things that you're talking about with jobs, right, what did they do? They blamed inflation on all of the jobs, but, but here's the thing, right? All of that mo new money that they've printed since 2008 has not just evaporated. It, it's not like once they print it, it evaporates. And, you know, to your point, the big seven have access to whatever they want, free money, cheap money, but that money is still floating around in the system. It doesn't mean that the stock market is worth that much more. It means that this currency is worth that much less and i need to remind everybody going back to 2008 that the central banks came out under that point it was janet yellen as the fed chair uh wait was she in 2008 but w whatever i my brain's a little it's a long long day and a long week but they they came out and actually the central bank actually said we are targeting real estate and stocks for reflation. 
So all of that money that's in the system, I, I'm not even so worried about the new money, although this next time the injection will be so much higher than it was in 2020, which was so much greater than it was in 2008. Yeah. We are at the end of this experiment's life cycle. Yeah. Period. And that's why you're seeing all of the geopolitical risks that are rising as we're sitting here and speaking. You're seeing the stock market that wants to correct. Mm -hmm. And honestly, the way that it works is the way that it works every single time. When enough risk has been transferred from the few, so from the elites, from those that have been chosen to win, to the many, to the public, to the retirement system, right? Mm -hmm. Where it is the public again that takes those losses. Then to keep this whole game floating will become way too expensive and the plug will be pulled. Yeah. And what was interesting about a month ago with the Yen carry trade, and I came out and said the same thing. It's going to be very interesting to see what the Federal Reserve does and whether or not and how quickly they drop interest rates, because that's telling. And so the fact that they stood firm at that moment and did not immediately drop interest rates was more about not creating that panic, right? Yeah. Then, then what the reality is because we'll see how much they drop those interest rates between now and the end of the year and whether or not they can do it in little teeny in increments and do it on a steady basis or they drop it 50 basis points and then 50 basis points, but it, 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 it's too late. At the core of Zhang's argument is the idea that the financial system is a tool for wealth transfer. Since the establishment of the Federal Reserve in 1913, the system has facilitated the transfer of wealth from the public to the elite. Zhang explains that each crisis, whether it's the Great Depression, the 2008 financial crisis, or the next one on the horizon results in the public bearing the brunt of the losses while the financial elite benefit. She stresses that the stock market's rise is not a reflection of true economic value, but rather a signal of currency devaluation. The more money that's printed, the less the currency is worth which is why tangible assets like gold and silver are essential for wealth preservation. Lynette Zhang delves into the rising geopolitical risks and stock market instability, pointing out that these are indicators of an impending major event. She compares the current situation to the yen carry trade crisis and notes that the Federal Reserve's hesitation to drop interest rates too quickly is telling. If rates are dropped too sharply, it could cause panic, but if they are dropped too slowly, the economy will continue to weaken. Zhang also draws attention to the fact that many people invest without understanding the underlying risks. Much of today's investment world is built on counterparty risk, meaning that assets like stocks, bonds, and real estate are dependent on other parties fulfilling their obligations. In contrast, gold and silver carry no counterparty risk and offer protection during times of financial turmoil. A lot of people invest without understanding what they're investing in because it is all to your point counterparty risk it's all contracts but when i'm looking at gold and you know i i just did this friday so it's it's reasonably fresh in my mind and obviously i don't have it in front of me but i was doing a piece on food because food becomes the biggest issue for people as we go through these transitions and according to the bls bureau of labor statistics Food inflation on a, a, a nice select basket, a pretty broad basket, uh, between 1913 and 2024 has gone up something like 2,500 and change percent. Silver during that same time frame and through Friday was up about 2,900 and change percent. So silver maintained, I mean, I mean, you gotta look at a loaf of bread at $1.98 or something like that and wonder where they're really buying it. But okay, let's assume that that data is accurate. Silver clearly maintained your ability to purchase and you could actually buy roughly 20% more with that same if you had, if you had it in silver yeah. than you could if you had it in dollars. So it maintained. But gold was it about, uh, I think like, 
15,000% and change, right? Because gold is the primary currency metal. Silver kind of straddles both worlds. Yeah. So I like silver for barterability to make sure that if I have to go to the grocery store to buy a, a basket of strawberries, I have money to do that. Yeah. But gold is really about wealth protection and true proper diversification so that if you are going to hold cryptocurrencies or you are going to hold st stocks mutual fund etc if what you have wall street wants you to think stocks and bonds are diversified but they're not because you can only convert it back into this crap right, right. tangible physical no counterparty risk outside of the market is gold and that's really what they do the reset against. Yeah. So that's why I, the lion's share of my wealth by far isn't even the collectible goals, gold. I use this, this raw pre-33 $20 gold piece for my savings account because it's not a whole lot more than this, which is my one, I can say only because of my bracelet, I have new eagles too. But basically, this is the only one ounce coin that I, uh, bullion coin that I personally own. So when you're talking about fractional pieces, which are smaller than an ounce, you know, what we do at Zhang Enterprises, and it's based upon my studies of currencies and currency life cycles, the strategy, the sound money strategy that we execute and help people develop is based on a layered approach mm -hmm. so that no matter where we are in this trend cycle, you are prepared to deal with it. And that even includes a level of cash because that's going to be most recognizable to begin with until people realize through hyperinflation how quickly that is losing value. Then you bring in your fractionals in both gold and silver for barterability, but it depends on what you're trying to accomplish, right? So if I wanna to go to the store with and get some strawberries, I've got this, this happens to be a silver 50 cent piece pre 1964, constitutional money. But if I wanna maintain my property taxes, then I want this, which is gold, because that will keep pace and more than uh, the taxes, at least that's what history shows. Obviously I can't guarantee anything other than I'll show up and do the work, but I want this. Now, what happens though, when they do those overnight resets, what is severely undervalued right now and what is severely overvalued like income producing real estate, for example, or even dividend paying stocks that actually have some underlying value because that's kind of hard to tell these days, right? But this is gonna flip flop. When that flip flops, I want the ability to convert some of my gold holdings into those then undervalued income producing assets that will then generate, I'm buying them at a bargain, and especially as the price of gold goes up, that means that, that what I'm converting into, I'm buying it with, with nothing, basically. It's like a free trade for me. Um, pretty close anyway, it depends on how high that reset goes. But it's, it's a whole strategy. Because I'm not saying that you can't do fine if you stack physical gold and physical silver. You're, you're, you're okay as long as there isn't an overt confiscation, you're okay to do bullion too. I can't guarantee that one way or the other. And historic precedents and current precedents around the world is telling me that there is a likelihood of confiscation. That's why I only do the uh, collectible gold and I don't have much in, in way of bullion. I basically bought this because I keep talking about it. So I felt like I had to have one in my hand. Yeah.